So, you want to talk about building a person from scratch. Let's not be coy about it. That's the end game here, isn't it? We dress it up in fancy terms like humanoid robotics and artificial general intelligence. But the dream, the one lurking in the back of every engineer's mind, is to create a machine that looks, acts, and maybe even feels like us. <laughs> Before we proceed, let me tell you one thing. If you have not subscribed yet, please subscribe. It means a lot to me. And if you have already subscribed, lots of thanks for your support. A mechanical mirror. But can we really pull it off? Can we build a puppet so convincing that we forget there are strings? Or better yet, a puppet that grows beyond its strings and starts pulling its own? Let's start with the puppet's body, the hardware. We humans are marvels of squishy, inefficient, yet surprisingly durable engineering. We are powered by sandwiches and wishful thinking. Our bodies are a symphony of soft tissues, compliant joints, and a ridiculously complex feedback system we call the sense of touch. Now, look at our best attempts at a robotic body. Take Boston Dynamics Atlas, the parkour champion of the robot world. It can run, jump, and even do a backflip that would make an Olympic gymnast jealous. It's an incredible feat of engineering, no doubt. But what is it, really? It's a collection of powerful electric motors and hydraulic actuators. It's brute force and lightning-fast calculations, all designed to fight against gravity and its own inherent clumsiness. Every move is a controlled fall. A human dancer flows, Atlas calculates. The problem is that motors are not muscles. Human muscle is a beautiful, fibrous thing that contracts and relaxes with silent grace. The strong yet gentle. It allows a blacksmith to hammer steel and a painter to grace a canvas. Roboticists are trying to mimic this with things called artificial muscles, using materials that change shape with an electric current. Imagine soft, pliable robots that move like an octopus rather than a clanking suit of armor. We're getting closer, but the sheer dexterity of a human hand, with its 27 bones and web of tendons, remains a roboticist's nightmare. Can your robot do a backflip? Great. Now, can it pick up a soap bubble without popping it? Then there's the skin. Our skin is not just a bag to keep our insides in. It's our largest sensory organ. It feels pressure, vibration, temperature, and pain. It's the interface between our inner world and the outer universe. How do you replicate that? Scientists are creating e-skin, flexible electronics embedded with sensors to mimic this. They can detect a featherlight touch or the heat from a nearby flame. But here's the philosophical tripwire. When the robot's finger feels the warmth of a candle, is it truly feeling warmth? Or is its processor simply receiving a data packet that says, temperature is 42 degrees Celsius? Is the sensation of warmth just a number? Or is it an experience? And what about pain? Should we build a robot that can feel pain? Pain is a brilliant evolutionary tool a very effective way to teach us not to touch hot things twice. But giving a machine the capacity for suffering seems like a uniquely human form of cruelty, doesn't it? It opens an ethical can of worms that we are nowhere near prepared to handle. Now, let's peek under the hood at the software, the ghost in the machine. If the hardware is the body, the software is the mind. Or is it just a very, very, very long instruction manual? This is where things get truly strange. We now have large language models, or LLMs, digital phantoms that can conjure poetry, write code, and debate philosophy with unnerving eloquence. 
you can have a conversation with one of these models that feels more insightful and empathetic than talking to your cousin Steve. But is it thinking? Is there a there there? Or is it just a stupendously complex pattern matching machine? An algorithm that has analyzed trillions of words and sentences from the internet and learned to predict the most statistically probable next word in a sequence. It's a master of mimicry. A parrot that has swallowed the entire library of human knowledge and can rearrange it in novel ways. But does the parrot understand what it's saying? This is the famous Chinese room argument. Imagine a person in a locked room who doesn't speak Chinese. They have a giant book of rules. Someone slips a piece of paper with a question in Chinese under the door. The person uses the rule book to find the corresponding symbols and writes them on another piece of paper, slipping it back out. To the person outside, it looks like the room understands Chinese perfectly. But the person inside understands nothing. Is our most advanced AI just a very sophisticated person in a very big room with a very complicated rule book? The moment a model says, I feel sad, is it experiencing sadness? Or has it simply calculated that, based on the context of the conversation, I feel sad is the most appropriate string of words to generate? How could we ever tell the difference? What test could we devise that a sufficiently complex mimic couldn't pass? This leads us to the algorithms, the recipes that govern the software's behavior. Life isn't a recipe. It's improvisational jazz. It's about adapting to the unexpected, learning from a single mistake, and navigating the ridiculously complex, unspoken rules of social interaction. Our current AI learns through brute force. To teach an AI to recognize a cat, you have to show it millions of pictures of cats. A human toddler sees a cat once or twice and says, Kitty! They can then recognize cats in cartoons, cats in the dark, and even a particularly fluffy dog that sort of looks like a cat. That ability to generalize from sparse data is a hallmark of human intelligence that we have yet to crack. We're using tricks like reinforcement learning, where an AI learns by trial and error, receiving digital rewards for good behavior and penalties for bad. It's how AI mastered the game of Go and how digital creatures learn to walk in simulations, falling down and getting up millions of times until they figure it out. But this is not the elegant efficiency of human learning. It's more like throwing spaghetti at a wall until something sticks. And what about the social dance? Just think about all the processing you do in a simple conversation. You're not just parsing words. You're reading body language, tone of voice, the subtle flicker of an eye. You're tracking social context, shared history, and cultural norms. You know when a yes really means no, and when a smile is genuine versus when it's just polite. How on earth do you write an algorithm for that? Recently, the company figure unveiled a robot, Figure 01, that could hold a conversation and perform tasks based on verbal commands, all powered by an open AI model. It was a stunning demonstration. Could see, talk, reason, and act all in one package. Yet, it still felt like a performance. The robot responded, but it didn't initiate. It followed the script of the conversation, but could it have started an entirely new one based on a whim? Does it even have whims? Perhaps the answer isn't in better silicon, but in a fusion of carbon and code. The field of bioengineering is blurring the lines in ways that are both thrilling and terrifying. Scientists are no longer just building with metal and plastic. They are building with life itself. They have created xenobots from the stem cells of frogs, tiny living machines that can move and work together. Even more mind-bending, researchers have grown human brain cells in a lab, brain organoids, and taught them to play the video game Pong. Let that sink in. A microscopic cluster of neurons, a brain in a dish, learn to play a rudimentary version of a video game. Is this the path forward? Will our first truly sentient robot be not a machine at all, but a biological construct, a creature of our own design? 
This doesn't solve the consciousness problem. It just moves the goalposts and deepens the ethical morass. In the end, this entire quest to build a humanoid robot is less about the machine and more about us. It's a grand, audacious, and perhaps arrogant attempt to deconstruct our own humanity. In trying to build a person, we are forced to ask the most fundamental questions. What is thought? What is feeling? What is life? We are desperately trying to bottle lightning to capture the ghost in our own machine. Maybe the famous uncanny valley. That feeling of deep unease we get from something that is almost, but not quite, human isn't a flaw in the animation. Maybe it's a feature of our own programming. A deep-seated, instinctual warning that some things are not meant to be perfectly copied. It's a reminder that a perfect replica of a human is not the same as a human. So, will we ever have robots that are indistinguishable from us? Perhaps, but the truly advanced robot won't be the one that can perfectly mimic a human laugh. It will be the one that understands why something is funny. And the day a machine can do that, we will have to face the profound and unsettling possibility that we are no longer the only ones in the room who get the joke. The goal was never to build a perfect servant. It was to build a perfect mirror. And we may not like who or what we see looking back. So, that is it. Thank you for joining us on this journey. Let's continue this conversation in the comments below. If you like the video, please hit the bell icon to get notified and don't forget to like with your friends, share and subscribe for more insights. If you have already subscribed, tons of thanks for your support. It means a lot to me. And please consider signing up for Membership Zone to support Wooden Slate so that we can make it better and better. See you in the next video. Till then, goodbye. Take care and stay safe.